the new member of our board is sitting tonight because uh, uh, one of our board members is uh, traveling on business. Um, to, to start with, uh, I have concerns, great concerns, about this contiguous and non-contiguous parcel. The current UDO in its current form says there shall be no land that can be developed in, the, in such a way as Mr. Couch is proposing with non-contiguous parcels. I mean, it, to, in my opinion, and not just my opinion, it's, it's truth that it's one thing to go two blocks over from his parcel, his land that he wants to develop, but when you go a quarter of a mile before you reach the next parcel that he owns, to me that's unreasonable. That's the very dis definition of non-contiguous, and I'm very concerned about that because based on the wording of the text amendment, additional parcels can be added perpetually from non-contiguous to contiguous based on uh, some compromise, and, and, I, and I need clarification on what the word reasonable means because it says non-contiguous tracks may be included in an OSMV district if the non-contiguous track or tracks is or demonstrated to form a reasonable connection with the overall purpose of the development. To me, that's very broad and very sweeping, and it's not specific, and I'm very concerned that it's going to infringe on property rights in a multitude of ways, and somebody's going to have to live with that project being right next door to them when under the current UDO, that would not be allowed. So I think some clarification needs to be made with what is a reasonable connection. Um, and I think we need to take that language out because of that issue. So if you would like for me to address that generally, and then I'll, I'll kick it to our attorney to further clarify that. but. Uh, some might would argue, let's, let's just take the I-73-150 Road Ridge Road uh, interchange area. Uh, some might perceive what's across, all the way across 73, uh, not to be contiguous, but uh, there are provisions in law about um, where uh, DOT, for instance, divides land that doesn't create a non-contiguous um, series of parcels, but um, I'll, I'll refer to our attorney to add to that. Scott, I'll, I'll make two points. One, in the general statutes regarding uh, annexation, as a matter of fact, there's language that provides that what, what rights of way, what rights of way set, uh, separate property, that two, two, is that two parcels, one on each side of the right of way, you ignore the right of way, you consider those parcels to be contiguous. So there's statutory authority that we're relying on here as a basis for that language in the, uh, in the proposed text amendment. The second thing I want to add is, if you read down a little bit further, you cannot add anything to the existing OSMV district without getting the property rezoned by the town council. So the town council retains control over the addition of Contiguous property or potentially contiguous property to an existing OSMB district. So it's not as if the developer can just go ahead and do it themselves. They have to apply to the town and get the property rezoned the OSMB district in order for that to happen. And each time this provision of this district would be before uh, the planning board and then before the town council to be considered in reference to whether that was an appropriate rezoning given the language that would be in this uh, district. So if, if I'm hearing correctly from the attorney and from you, Scott, that it would ultimately be up to the council to determine what reasonableness is. Well, I think that would be part of the uh, analysis when the rezoning request is brought before the town council, yes. Okay. Any further comments or questions? Ms. Carter? Ms. Rooney? Yes. Um, were they talking about minor modifications? So, um, okay. in, uh, on page 15, page 4 15. And there's a new definition for minor modifications. 
Then if you go down to the next area, it's about the development regulations. And it says that plan books describing architectural styles and details would be a part of the development regulations. And I want to know, so most of this will come as drawings. There will be drawings. These are drawings. They're going to bring drawings to us and say, this is what we're going to build. It, I, I was lucky enough to attend a zoning board meeting years and years ago when Nancy Hess got the uh, building at the corner of Lake Brand and 150 to not look like a box. The one that has the Domino's pizza and the little grill in it now. Some of us won the board then, by the way. Some of us what? Some of us won the board when that happened. Were you? Yes, well, it was. <laughs> uh, when it goes well. It was an amazing, amazing meeting. And it went well close to midnight. So the question that I have is when we are given these drawings and we are told that this is what the architectural styles and details will be, if all of a sudden the chain, if all of a sudden what's requested is we're just going to build a box here or a little strip mall instead of the very attractive little commercial area with the is is that going to be a minor modification, or will we hold the line on the architectural plans and details that we approve, if we approve it, as a zoning board? So when the, when it comes to us as a zoning board, there will have the the plan books, and I want to know: is this going to be, are these going to be minor modifications, or are we going to hold the line? Are you looking at me for the answer to that? No, I'm looking at Scott. Okay, good. Because I can't answer it. Well, the heart of it is that uh, a project like this absolutely involves form-based code, and I know that is, is, has been a term that uh, has, has been frowned upon, but uh, as, as the project was presented, and I don't want to get into the details of that, but there was a lot of effort and explanation that went into explaining that um, form-based code, uh, which will, will ultimately be realized in those regulating documents, that development agreement, that again is part of a whole other step if this text amendment uh, were to pass, when, when an applicant comes forward with a rezoning, that development agreement uh, is, is a large, complicated part of that request. And uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, <coughs> pictures and illustrations that will be a part of that. Uh, but I'm not quite sure I'm understanding your, your question beyond that. So it says minor modifications can be approved. Um, By staff. Staff, yes. That's all. That's, I just, never mind. That's it. Yeah, that's my issue right there. Do, if, if we approve a zoning based on this, do we get what we are promised? So the minor modifications, I think, is more utilized after a development agreement and rezoning are passed. So that's okay. after the zoning board planning board has a review, and after the town, town council approves something, that's when minor modifications come into play. Um, I think what part of your question is about is actually on page 7 at the bottom. Page seven. Page seven. I'll wait for Scott to get there as well. Okay. So the very last sentence there. Um, with project submissions to this district, the applicant will propose regulated documents to be negotiated and approved by council. Now, to be negotiated and approved. I, I, I believe, you know, we haven't done none of these, but I believe that the planning board would probably be part of that negotiation process as well. Right. I think that's where you're more referring to, is that right? Yeah, that in, after, in that process. Once, then staff becomes the arbiter of minor modifications. Right, which can be further clarified in those development agreements. All right. For regulations. Okay, that's it. That's my issue. So, Dick, on the, um, the minor modifications, we could stay there just for a second. 
The second paragraph underneath minor modification, it says, in the first paragraph, it specifically says, what page on this card? Um, on page 15, I'm sorry. Under my, minor modification, we're still there. The first paragraph says that uh, as long as it does not include changes in use, an increase in density, or expansion of the boundary of the approved district. And in the very next paragraph, it says, for phased developments, reallocations, to me that's a little word silent, reallocation of uses and densities may be allowed within the greater development. So it's just contradicting itself in the next paragraph. And I guess it pertains to the, the phrase for phased development. And I'm assuming that any development that Mr. Couch does is going to be done in phases. You've got the clearing and the grading and the excavation process. I've been in real estate for 24 years and pretty familiar with how it works. Then you've got the sewer and the water and all of that. And then you go to the, to the whether it's a, a foundation or slab. But that's kind of confusing to me that under the first paragraph it says that you cannot change the density, uh, increase the density, and then in the next one it says you can if it's in a phased development. Each district may identify quali qualifying criteria for minor modifications. So if you could give me some further uh, insight on why in that top paragraph it says you can't change the density, and in the one underneath it, it says that you can for the phased project. Mr. Collier, if I, if I might, I, I think that the intention of that language is that suppose we have uh, a development where uh, the overall density is, say, 2,000 dwelling units, just using that as an example. And uh, the first phase uh, is supposed to have uh, 200 units, and the second phase is supposed to have uh, 180 units. Well, there could be a change in the plans so that the developer decides that he only wants to put 190 units in the first phase, and he'll shift those other 10% or 10 units to the second phase. The overall density cannot change, but can be switched between different pods or or uh, subsections of the development. I got you. Like like carbon credits. Something similar to that, yes. Okay. But Mr. Carr, you're, you're a real estate agent. You, I'm sure you're familiar with Adams Farm. Yes. Uh, it's a large development. Many, many bases. Oh, yes. Okay, this, what Mr. Uh, Couch would have here, if he were to get this to prove, his, his property is about the same size as Adams Farm. Sure. So it, he's already, to develop that property, um, it, it would be over, he's told the, the planning board in the past it would be a 25-year program to develop the property if he gets approval. Yeah, thanks for the, for the clarification. I understand exactly. And, and the purpose of, of adding this is just so as we get further into these discussions with the project, um, we're not arguing over what a minor mo modification means. So this is providing a definition that uh, that tries to address the core components that, that folks would be most concerned about. And I feel also might address uh, Kathy Rooney's comment about, you know, what if they try to put a big box in that doesn't meet the uh, requirements? Well, in that case, you have to rely on your administrator to say no. It doesn't meet the requirements. Because you're not going to have just pictures. You're going to have some narrative that is going to try to describe what the architectural style and limitations and requirements are supposed to be. And if what's presented to the administrator does not satisfy that, then the administrator says no. And if the developer doesn't like it, he goes ahead and he appeals to the Board of Adjustment, just like otherwise would happen. Thank you. Ms. Whitaker, any questions? Comments? I think comments. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think you can. Pull it closer. Just pull it closer. Okay. Um, my comments are more general. Um, this is a new concept, this um, village cluster development. It is a concept that we haven't had really here in Summerfield. My concern is, what is the growth going to be like? Um, as our one planner instructed us always, remember, you moved here, you can't <coughs> close the door. 
Um, and the, we like it the way it is, the rural feel. However, we are going to have development. Uh, there are pro population pressures. And how are we going to do the development? Are we going to continue with this punch in, punch out, big houses on, on large lots? Or is it make, does it make more sense to conserve our resources, have more open space, um, and have a little bit better um, planning for our natural resources and our animals? So take that land, cluster it together, those, those buildings, and you can have more opportunity to plan for the natural resources. Plan for those um, animal corridors. And with 900 plus acres, you can do that kind of thing. And if you cluster your houses, that must mean that you won't have so much transportation. If you want to just go and pick up some milk, you will be able to do that. Maybe even with your bicycle. Okay, walk. So, um, but, but the, the point of it is, I see what's developing now, and we're losing farm fields, we're losing a lot of um, connectivity for wildlife. So, to preserve our natural resources and to introduce a new concept that makes more sense makes more sense because we can take that land from the clustering that we get and use it then for, for um, more, um, better planning for our natural resources. And, um, and I just don't like the cookie cutter lots that we're getting, small. And so I prefer to see the rural feel like I think everybody agrees on the rural field. And, uh, but, anyway, that's, that's about the... Uh, <laughs> 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 I said I agree with Trudy. We're going to have change. We better get the best we can get and save our open space. Uh, houses. Everybody had talked about the development and how you like the community and everything. I've not been in any developments that had any rural character to them. They're just a housing development. We need something different, something that will be here for our children and grandchildren. As it is now, we can't leave anything to our children and grandchildren because they can't afford what we've got. So I can leave my grandchildren. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. So I guess it's, it's my turn to ask a few clarifying questions. I have a, a couple pages of questions. Uh, the tax amendment doesn't provide any specific standards for the village district. So if the town doesn't like something that's being proposed, how can the town effectively deny or try to mitigate what's being requested without being viewed in a court of law as arbitrary and capricious? Yes. Yeah. That's for you, Mr. Lawyer. Well, the standards will be provided in the development agreement, which will be negotiated and subject to a hearing by the planning board and then by the town council before it's approved. So, I mean, essentially the development agreement is the zoning regulations for this OSNB district. Okay, but what if during that process the town cannot reach an, uh, an, an agreement on what is reasonable in, in some respects of what's being proposed. How is that arbitrated if we can't reach an agreement between ourselves and a developer? Well, we just keep on negotiating. I guess we wind up in court eventually on that. All right. Um, the, um, the tax amendment allows additional land of up to 10 percent to be added to the original parcel uh, to be added to that district uh, through normal rezoning process. Uh, is there a time limit on when such requests have to be submitted? Is, is, for example, if we were to approve a text amendment today for, for one of these uh, types of developments in a 25-year build-out, could somebody come in at the 25th year and, and ask for an expansion of 10%? The 10% the language has to do with contiguity. 
And the 10% limitation is only that no more than 10% of the OSMZ district may consist of non-contiguous land. That is, you could have a, a satellite, you have a thousand acres, right? Right, okay. A uh, hundred acres of that could theoretically be non-contiguous. Okay. 10%, up to up to 100 acres. But, and that's total for that rezoning of that district. But that doesn't address the question I've, I've raised. I don't understand the question. Okay, let me, let me rephrase it. This text amendment allows additional land to be added to the village district. Is there a time limit on when that additional land can be added? Could it be, could it be, there's no time limit. Okay, that's all I want to know. Um, the Unified Ownership and Control in Article 4, D5, uh, I think it's on page 9 of our packet, uh, and on page 4-9 of the EDO, the article contains the words, record with the register of deeds. Am I correct if I'm interpreting that to mean that if an applicant comes in with a rezoning request on this, under this text amendment, if, if approved, that uh, even though all the property are not owned by one person, it's a contractual arrangement, and that contractual arrangement is binding and registered and registered in the courthouse that it, it has to be followed. It'd be a land record that runs with the land. Yes. So, so it's, it's kind of like covenants. Okay, so it, it's binding on someone uh, forever, basically. Yes. Okay. Um, Packet four, page 14 of the packet, uh, at page uh, <coughs> four, 414 of the ordinance, uh, a design that protects scenic vistas. An excellent question is can we effectively protect scenic vistas if uh, we remove all protection for scenic overlay uh, along certain major arteries in the town? Is that, how can we protect scenic views? There will still be a development agreement with regulations that will govern how the vistas or how development along those uh, vistas uh, may proceed. It's not carte blanche necessarily. There will be regulations. They're just not. So with the, 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 the town has some control over what what the what the setbacks would be, and, and so it won't necessarily be battleground avenue. So, so, think about, so think about our comprehensive plan and how it uh, promotes uh, protection of those areas and, and view sheds. And even though there, there's a commitment to um, adjust our scenic corridor provisions, uh, and I say commitment in relation to one of the resolutions that council recently passed, what this says is that all of that doesn't get thrown out of the window just because we're bypassing uh, those strict scenic corridor regulations. It says it considers and illustrates. So what that says is that uh, there will have to be a compelling um, you know, argument on behalf or, or a case stated on behalf of the applicant uh, to work through that development 